Welcome back, everyone. Uh, our next speaker is Juliet Bruce from the University of Wisconsin at Ms. Madison, and she'll be talking about semi-ample asymptotic syzygies. And just as a reminder, her slides are also on the conference website. Okay, thank you so much, Jared, and thank you to all the other organizers for putting this on, and thank you to all the participants for joining us online. Uh, this has been a great experience. Um, so I'm going to talk about semi-ample asymptotic syzygies. And kind of the main setup of asymptotic syzygies is the idea that we want to study the algebraic graded Betty numbers of a variety as the positivity of the embedding increases in some interesting way. So the main setup here is that X is going to be an n-dimensional smooth projective variety, and it's going to be embedded into some projective space. I'm going to call that P R sub D by a very ample line bundle L sub D. And I want to think about L sub D as being one in a sequence of line bundles. So there's an L sub zero, an L sub one, an L sub three, and so on. So we're thinking about that lower index D as being kind of the index of my sequence. And likewise, the index on R sub D just tells me how big is the projective space corresponding to that line bundle. And kind of the idea is to impose some interesting condition on the sequence of line bundles L sub D and then ask how does that translate into interesting results on the algebraic Betty numbers of the variety. Um, an example might be if you look at P2, the projective plane, and you embed by O of 2, you get different defining equations for each D, and then you can ask the question, how do those defining equations, or how do the relations amongst those defining equations, the syzygies, change as you vary D, for example, uh, to be a bit more precise. So again, we're in the same setup as before. We're embedding X by a sequence of line bundles, and so to each to x in each line bundle l sub d, I can associate the section ring. Um, if you prefer to think about this more kind of algebraically, you can get away with just thinking about s of x comma ld as being the homogeneous coordinate ring of x with respect to this embedding. So I have x embedded into some projective space, so it's cut out by some homogeneous polynomials, and I can think about s of x comma ld being the homogeneous polynomial ring. I'm going to all the positivity conditions I impose in this talk will allow me to kind of associate those two things together simultaneously. And we want to think about this ring as being a module over the kind of the ambient polynomial ring. So again, it's in projective space. So we can think about this as being the quotient of the polynomial ring in R D plus one variables um, by the homogeneous defining ideal. And so right for each line bundle L sub B, I get a different section ring. And I can think about how those section rings vary with D. Um, and in particular, I want to look how does the minimal graded free resolution of this section ring, SXLD, vary as I change my line bundle L sub D in some interesting way. So maybe the picture we should have in our heads is that we're going to walk kind of along some path in the ample cone and look how this graded minimal free resolution of SXLD um, changes as we kind of change our line bundle. And of course, it might be too much to ask to know everything about the minimal graded free resolution um, on, the, on its nose. So instead, we want to focus for this talk just on the particular question of looking at the number of minimal generators of FP in degree Q. So we go P steps back in our resolution, and that's some finitely generated um, module over S. And we want to kind of know how many generators of degree Q live there. And we write that number as beta p sub q of x ld. So these numbers depend on kind of what homological degree I'm in, I'm in i.e. p, what kind of degree generators am I looking at q, and then what is my embedding line bundle l sub d. And we want to know how do these numbers vary as a function of d. Um, I'll also say this is the number of syzygies of degree q and homological degree p. I'm going to use the word syzygies and Betty numbers or graded Betty numbers interchangeably throughout most of this talk. Okay, and it's most useful to put these numbers that have two indices into some sort of table called a Betty table. And so we do this by taking beta p comma p plus q and putting it into the pq spot of the table. So in, in this table, kind of the um, horizontal axis corresponds to p, my homological degree, where the vertical axis corresponds to q, i.e. the degree of the generators. So in the pq spot, I'm asking 
how many generators of degree P plus Q are there in homological degree P? And the reason for this kind of wonky um, change of coordinates is just that it makes this table more concise to look at, and it's a little bit um, less sparse. The minimal condition, minimality conditions on a graded free resolution would actually force this table to be strictly lower triangular if you didn't make this change of coordinates. So really, we're just kind of making the table a little bit easier to read with this change of coordinates. OK, and so the first place I want to talk about is um, the case of curve. So instead of x being n-dimensional, let's just think of it as being a smooth projective curve of genus G. And we're embedding um, by a line bundle of degree D. Again, I said the interesting idea here is we want to impose some condition on the positivity of my line bundles. And so here on curves, the condition of positivity we're imposing is that L sub D has degree D. And in this setting, kind of the first results of syzygies kind of for curves goes back to Castle Lenovo and many others, although they might not have looked at them in this framework of asymptotic syzygies. And that's the classical theorem that if D is large enough, namely 2G plus 1, then the line bundle L sub D defines an embedding into projective space. And if D is one bigger, D is bigger than 2G plus 2, then the ideal I sub X, so the homogeneous defining ideal of our curve, is in fact generated by quadrics. And if you haven't thought about this before, let's kind of translate this theorem to what we would actually find out about what this says about the Betty tables. And so the idea is part one tells us that X is actually embedded into projective space, which means the section ring is going to look like S mod IX for some idea, for the defining ideal IX. And so that first step in my minimal graded free resolution is actually going to be zeros in this first column. So I get a one and then zeros the rest of the way here. So that first part tells us I get a zero in this spot. And if we think about it, this first column corresponds to the generators of the defining ideal. And so part two says that if we're only generated by quadrics, then there are no cubics. And so beta one comma three is going to be zero. So part two would tell us we get vanishing of this second Betty number in the second row. And if you think about this for a second, this seemed like it might be a pattern. D bigger than 2G plus 1 gave us vanishing in the first spot. 2G plus 2 gave us vanishing in the second spot. And you might ask whether this continues on. And in fact, it does, but this wasn't noticed until much later when Mark Green in the 80s noticed that this is part of kind of a bigger story. Um, but to kind of tell that story, I need to introduce a definition. And that's of rho sub q of xld. So again, I'm going to fix an index q here. So I'm fixing a row in my table. And then I'm looking at x embedded by the line bundle ld. And I'm counting how many non-zero entries are in that row and dividing by r sub d, which in essence by Hilbert's syzygy theorem is telling me what is the percentage of non-zero syzygies in the qth row. So I'm looking in that qth row and I'm just saying, how many non-zero things are there as a percentage? And a theorem of Mark Green says that if X is a smooth curve and the degree of the line bundle is D, so we're kind of in the setting we've been in so far, then the percentage of the non-zero entries in the second row as D goes to infinity goes to zero. So kind of in essence, what Mark Green's theorem says is that somehow asymptotically for high degree of curves, we expect the um, the syzygies to be as simple as possible, to occur in the smallest possible degree. Um, in particular, we kind of continue to get this vanishing theorem that we saw from Castellanovo continues for higher and higher d. Um, and this kind of suggested a little bit of a heuristic um, that as the positivity of the embedding increases, we might expect the syzygies to become better and better behaved, um, as is kind of often highlighted in many things. For example, if you take higher and higher powers, Veronese powers of a ring, you expect to get nicer properties eventually, like casualness and other things. And so it's natural to think maybe Green's theorem suggests some generalization. And in fact, a lot of work went into generalizing Green's theorem into many different directions of, kind of, of proving um, non-vanishing results for the certain rows uh, that went under kind of the heading of Green's NP conditions. But it turns out this is kind of a little bit of a red herring, that we don't see Green's theorem actually generalizing to varieties of higher dimension. Um, and this was 
kind of demonstrated by in 2012 by work of Ein and Lazarfeld, who said, who showed that if n is bigger than two, so if we're not in the case of curves, which was previously covered by work of Green, and we fix some row q, and if our line sequence of line bundles satisfies the condition that any sub subsequent difference is constant and ample, then the percentage of non-zero entries in the qth row is not going to be zero, but is in fact going to be one. So Green said this limit would be zero, so syzygies were in the simplest possible degrees, but Ein and Lazarfeld managed to show that for higher dimensional varieties, this is kind of, we get the entire opposite result, namely we get syzygies in every possible degree. So if you want to think about what that table kind of looks like for things of really high degree, in some sense for surfaces and higher, we're going to get a lot of non-zero entries. In fact, every possible entry should be non-zero. And the reason we kind of see this dichotomy here is that it turns out that there was kind of a coincidence that allowed us to compute that, that allowed the percentage for curves to be zero. Green actually managed to prove a stronger statement, namely giving an explicit bound on um, how fast you were getting vanishing in the second row. And it's just turned out to be that you get linear vanishing for curves, and it turns out R sub D also grows linearly for curves, and that allows you to recover um, show that the syzygies become as simple as possible. But for surfaces, um, linear vanishing is not enough to actually give you anything, uh, give you a positive percentage because R sub D for a surface or a threefold or something of higher dimension is going to be growing much faster than linear in general. Okay. And so I want to focus for a second on this condition that L sub D plus one minus L sub D is constant and ample. And so again, I said, the name of the game kind of here is to fix some condition on the positivity and then ask what this implies about the syzygies. And so in this case, the condition on the syzygies really kind of amounts to we fix some base point in the ample cone, and then we're going to walk around along a ray of positive fixed slope. So, you know, L sub one equals L sub two plus some ample and so on. We're kind of always adding on the same uh, ample line bundle to here. So L sub D might be D times an ample line bundle plus whatever base point you started at in the ample cone. Um, and in the case they were most interested in, namely kind of the case of projective space in some ways was kind of the first test case for this. Um, this condition isn't much, uh, you know, doesn't impose many conditions, but on other varieties, varieties where the ample cone is higher dimensional, um, there are other inter more interesting ways you can pretend to go, you can imagine going off to infinity. And that kind of is where my work steps in. So my theorem that I want to talk about today says that if we let X be a product of projective space, so PN cross PM, and we fix some row Q in the interesting range, then there exists explicit constants CIJ and DIJ um, such that the percentage of non-zero syzygies in the qth row of x embedded by O of d1, d2. So I'm going to take my product of projective spaces, do a segue of degree d1, or a Veronese of degree d1 on the first factor and a Veronese of degree d2 on the second factor, and then embed by a segue. The percentage of non-zero syzygies for that resulting variety is at least one minus some very explicit function. Um, that is given in terms of D1, D2, um, and so on. So in particular, I'm able to capture the explicit asymptotic behavior for kind of the percentage of non-zero syzygies in the Q throw here for any Q in the interesting behavior. And why this is interesting in some sense is because, exactly because it allows us to look at things where we don't impose that condition that L sub D plus one minus L sub D is constant and fixed. In particular, uh, and instead of going off to infinity along a ray of positive slope, my con since my condition, my theorem has no conditions on D1 and D2, other than that O of D1, D2 is eventually very ample, we can actually go off to infinity in more interesting fashion. So, um, in most interesting, I think, is what happens when you go along off to infinity along a ray of kind of that's horizontal or entirely vertical. Because this is um, what correspond to 
the difference of my two line bundles, L sub D plus one minus L sub D, not necessarily being ample, but instead a weaker condition known as semi-ample. And just to remind you, a line bundle L is semi-ample if some multiple of it is base point free. So you should think ample means some multiple of it defines embedding into projective space. And semi-ample means some multiple of it doesn't give you an embedding to projective space, but just gives you a well-defined morphism. So kind of the quintessential example here you should have in mind for a semi-ample line bundle is O of 1, 0, or O of 0, 1 on a product, which would just correspond to the projection onto each factor. And so really what I want to suggest with my theorem is kind of imagining what happens if we take this ample condition in Ein and Lazarfeld's result and weaken it to just being semi-ample, do we see new and interesting results? Can we see, do the syzygies in these kind of new, more interesting ways going off to infinity behave more interesting or behave in an interesting fashion? And I think the answer is yes. So as an example, if we do n is equal to one and m is equal to five, so I'm looking at p1 cross p5, and I let q be two, so I'm looking at the second row of my table, and, and then my theorem says the number of non-zero syzygies in that second row is at least one minus this very explicit kind of function in terms of d1 and d2. And the interesting thing is that since there's both d1 and d2, the actual asymptotic of this, if only one of them goes off to infinity, is kind of subtle. Um, so for example, if d1 goes off to infinity, but d2 is fixed, the percentage of non-zero syzygies in the second row is bounded below by one minus um, this particular number, um, which in particular is definitely not going to be zero and not going to be one for any particular D2. So what this seems to suggest is that we have a lower bound on the percentage of non-zero syzygies in the second row. That is not what we saw um, coming from Mark Green in the case of curves, I, it's not zero and is different from what we saw in the ample setting of Ein and Lazarfeld, namely one, we're kind of seeing some potentially intermediate behavior. And in fact, in a number of certain areas, I'm willing to conjecture that this percentage won't be, uh, will be strictly between zero and one, although it doesn't follow in many cases from my theorem, you can kind of massage some of the results in there to show for a, a certain examples that you will get a number between zero and one, and I'm willing to conjecture that more generally. So kind of the way I approach proving this is to generalize min the monomial methods of Ein, Erman, and Lazarfeld, but actually kind of were first thought about at a previous WAGS meeting, I think Daniel told me about 10 years ago, um, to explicitly not produce non-trivial syzygies. So the idea somehow is you wanna compute an element in the Cajul cohomology, and you wanna use very explicit monomial methods to actually write down something in that cohomology, that's non-zero in that cohomology group. And the idea behind this is to really lean on the fact that you can do a very nice Artinian reduction in many cases. So in the cases Ein, Ehrman, and Lazarfeld considered, they were able to quotient by a very nice monomial regular sequence, namely the power of the variables that allowed them to then kind of work in the Artinian setting to really explicitly produce a non-zero syzygy. But there turns out to be a big kind of stumbling block in the case of a product of projective spaces. And the first stumbling block is that there are no monomial regular sequences on PN cross PM. And so from the very beginning, we have to kind of work with something more interesting. And we have to work with this kind of bilinear um, regular sequence that we see here. So this is the regular sequence I work with for N equals two and M equals four. It kind of first appeared in work of uh, Ehrman, or sorry, Eisenbud and Schreier on kind of boyd soderberg theory. And the, really the key, one of the keys to understanding how to produce non-zero syzygies is to really understand this ideal. So be able to say things like when the, like this particular monomial is not in this ideal, but if you multiply it by x0 or x1 or y0 or y1, it is in the ideal. So you kind of have to have that really fine control um, of understanding this ideal that I, Ehrman, and Lazarfeld are able to get somewhat more easily because they are able to work with actual monomial regular sequences. And the proof, the heart of the proof really exploits the fact that while this isn't a monomial regular sequence, it has a lot of symmetries, i.e. it's homogeneous with respect to a number of different gradings. So for example, it's 
uh, homogeneous with respect to the standard by grading, it's homogeneous with respect to the standard z grading. Um, but there's also kind of other more non-trivial ones. For example, the sum of each indice of the indices is always constant, which allows you to kind of induce a non-standard grading here. And when you combine all of these symmetries with a kind of delicate spectral sequence argument, you can actually um, produce non-zero elements in this ideal in very um, particular degrees that allow you to construct non-zero syzygies. Um, and doing that, you can actually sh show the non-vanishing result that I was able to state for PN cross PM. But I really want to think that the main idea takeaway of this should be that I think syzygies in the semi-ample setting should be really interesting and seem to suggest there's a bigger story to tell than we've kind of seen before. Something in between the case of curves and the case of kind of higher dimensional varieties embedded by ample line levels. And I'll stop there and thank you all for listening. Thank you, that was wonderful. Uh, we have five minutes for questions, so raise your hand. Uh, oh, we already have a question. Um, let's start with Remy. Hello, thank you for your wonderful talk. Um, I had a question about, I guess, the generalization yet. Uh, maybe you mentioned about this. Um, so this version is for for PN cross PM with with O D one D two. Yes. Is there some sort of work in progress or a generalization where you take, say, two semi-ample line bundles on a variety or some other some other generalization of this? So that's a great question, and um, I think the answer is no. There is, as far as I know, not ongoing work on that. I think it's a really interesting question. Um, but I don't have a lot of ideas for how to really generalize this in a lot of, in many directions. Um, I do think you could push this a little further and show that a similar vanishing statement is true for any product of arithmetically Cohen Macaulay varieties. But going beyond that, I think, um, is a really interesting and kind of next open question. And I guess so the problem is constructing these interesting ideals. Is that, is that what the problem is? I mean, yeah. So, I mean, the problem is that somehow these monomial methods don't seem to really want to push, or these generalized monomial methods don't seem to really want to go beyond things that are arithmetically Cohen Macaulay, which is um, makes a, this just sort of general, this direction of generalization a little more difficult. Although um, it's definitely possible that some Ein and Lazarfeld or modifications of the Ein and Lazarfeld original argument might also give you some potential interesting results in that vein. Thanks. Yeah, our next question is actually from uh, Robert Lazarsfeld. Rob, are you there? Yeah, I'm trying to do it. Okay, am I? Can you? Am I okay now? Yep. Um, do you have any conjectures on how the Betty numbers should grow? I do not. That's a great question. I do not have any sense for how the actual Betty numbers should grow themselves. Um, I will say that in very particular cases, so for Herzebrook surfaces, um, I am able to show that um, there is an analogy to kind of your normal distribution paper with um, Daniel and Lawrence, where the first row is going to be normally distributed, but the second row will not be. It'll be some percentage of kind of a truncated normal distribution, but mm, actually saying much more than that, um, is something I don't know, although it's a very interesting question. Okay, thanks. Uh, Adam Capillo has a question. Hi. Um, so it looks like your, your methods are very constructive and are like very naturally suited to producing lower bounds on these percentages. Do yes. you have any thoughts on like how one would go about producing upper bounds on these percentages? Or do you believe that they're sharp or so, like, what's up? I don't think I do not I don't believe my lower bounds are going to be sharp in general. Um, in certain cases, um, I think you can definitely make these take these methods and really focus on those particular examples and make them sharp in a narrow sense set of examples. But in general, they won't be. Um, getting upper bounds would be great and really interesting, I think, um, and is what you would need to prove the conjecture. What I conjecture that it would these percentages are going to be strictly between zero and one, but that seems very difficult. Um, kind of proving both a, a non-vanishing and a vanishing result seems pretty tricky and delicate. 
great. Uh, I think uh, I think let's let's wrap it up. That was fantastic, uh, and let's let's all uh, thank Juliet for a wonderful talk. <laughs>